Welcome to a special episode of the CEC Report. On today's show, we are going to be discussing the National Bank Infrastructure Solution. Currently in Australia, we have a fixation on infrastructure, a political fixation. There's a lot of discussion about it. And the, the, as of recording this, it's the week after the Victorian state election, where the new Premier-elect, Dan Andrews, um, campaigned on a promise of scrapping a project called the East West Link, uh, which is a toll road project, and cancelling a contract that had been written. And so he's in a dispute now with the federal government over $3 billion that the federal government had earmarked to put towards this project. And this is in, in the context that Tony Abbott has claimed that he wants to be the infrastructure prime minister of Australia. And his treasurer, Joe Hockey, has gone around with a program of encouraging the states to uh, roll over their assets, he calls it, or recycle their assets so that they can be privatised and the money from those privatisations put into new infrastructure. Now, the way Joe Hockey puts it, he's pinning a lot of hope for Australia's economic future on these infrastructure projects actually generating economic activity. And it's a particularly acute here in the state of Victoria where we're shooting this because we've, had, we've got places such as Geelong and Broad Meadows where people are in the car industry are losing their jobs at a fast rate and they're about to be all gone very soon. Um, and when Joe Hockey this week weighed into this dispute with Victoria over the $3 billion, he actually sounded quite desperate. We need this money spent into the economy quickly. And if Dan Andrews won't do it on this project, he should do it on another project straight away, but it's got to be spent. Anyway, so that's just by way of background for the, the reason why we're doing a show on this today, because the whole thing is an absolute farce. And we're going to go through the reason why it's a farce and what the only real solution for what is a real need of infrastructure um, is, and that is a national bank. First, the reason it's a farce, the kind of money that's being talked about even more than the $3 billion, there's, you know, uh, w all the kind of projects they're discussing adding up, is a pittance compared with the need. And the need is, we need to fill Australia's infrastructure deficit. And that deficit has been put at $700 billion. Now that figure has been arrived at in various ways, but one of the ways is, is um, uh, that we were part of calculating was back in the 19, up until the 1970s, infrastructure spending in Australia was roughly around 8% of GDP. And since then, it's collapsed down to less than 2%. And consequently, our economy has suffered. Because if the, there's a reason you build infrastructure. We need it for the, for the uh, it's the arteries of the economy, actually getting things transported to and fro, people being able to travel, etc. Infrastructure is important. And of course, very all the viewers that are watching this will be very familiar with, you know, um, trains that are unreliable and then periodically some small disaster happens and they're, they're, they're all grounded or, or, or um, frozen. Uh, you know, freeways and tollways in, in gridlock, etc. And all this is a real cost to the economy, which, is a co which is, has been caused by really a lot of uninvestment, uh, underinvestment in infrastructure for a long time. So this needs to be addressed. Infrastructure needs to be addressed. And the question is, how do you really do it? Well, before we go through the actual solution, let's just discuss the main way that the Abbott and Hockey government are promoting as the way of funding infrastructure, and in fact, Labor governments also promote. And that is through privatised infrastructure or public-private partnerships. Now, these kinds of projects are a joke because of this reason. When you add a monetary profit component to infrastructure as a necessity, as part of the mix, that this is what's got to be done, when you add that, you're projecting something false onto the, onto the equation and consequently it distorts the outcome. Infrastructure then gets built for the profit it can generate, not for the productivity it can generate. And that's a key distinction. And in what you end up having it is, like Sydney, a lot of toll roads. Where, yeah, the roads are useful, but the expense on the driver 
to use those roads to get across Sydney is very prohibitive and there are little um, tricks in the contracts for these toll roads where the government makes concessions that it will not build uh, competitive infrastructure parallel to those roads under the term of the contract so that the contract can max so the toll road can maximize its traffic and therefore maximize its profit and it ends up being not that productive in the long run anyway that's what happens when you take the public private partnership approach and we've discussed this on this show quite a few times but there's an added component to it where in fact the way public private partnerships are structured the government actually ends up carrying the risk of a project so the public takes the risk of the investment and private in, private investors tend to, um, in most cases, walk away with the profits. And it's just a, really a subsidise, um, a subsidy for industry, for private big business, and it's, um, uh, and, you know, it, it, it's, that's an irony because a lot of the big businessmen involved in these kinds of businesses are the same ones who go around preaching that you shouldn't subsidise other industries, you shouldn't subsidise agriculture, you shouldn't subsidise manufacturing, those kinds of things. So that's the, that's the, the approach that we've become uh, used to in Australia, which is all important. And at the G20 meeting that was just held in Brisbane, Joe Hockey um, uh, was instrumental in getting Australia to become the base of what he calls a global infrastructure hub, where we will be promoting this type of approach to infrastructure for not just Australia, but the whole world. And we call it the Macquarie Bank model, because an Australian, well, the City of London Bank that exists in Australia called Macquarie Bank pioneered it, and they've taken it around the world and they're very dominant in the way, and very influential over the government in Australia. So we reject that outright. And what we're going to talk about now is it's such a beautiful way of funding infrastructure um, that it's, it's a crime, and it, a real crime, that it's not being done. But once you understand it, you realise this is the solution, and anything less should not be tolerated anymore. And that solution is a national bank utilised properly, and that's what the CEC is fighting for, and we want you to fight for it with us. But before we do, we'll take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the, the national bank solution to funding infrastructure. Welcome back to the CEC report, where we are discussing the national bank infrastructure solution. So before the break, we were talking about the way the government wants everything done in terms of infrastructure in a privatised way through public-private partnerships, etc. And the consequence is you get infrastructure built for profit, not for productivity for the public good. How can you build, how can you fund infrastructure that's not for profit but for productivity? Well, the solution is a national bank. We're going to go through that now. Um, in 2002, the CEC produced this publication. And it was one of the most important editions of our new citizen that we did. Facing the Depression, a Fascist Police State or Economic Development. Now, the polemic of the headline is what we've experienced ever since. And we do have a Fascist Police State in Australia. And we didn't get the economic development we need. But the guts of this publication is actually a, a um, special report which we call the Infrastructure Road to Recovery. Let's build our way out of the Depression. And the CEC produced this in collaboration with this gentleman. This is Professor Lance Endersby, or Emer Emeritus Professor Lance Endersby, who has now passed away as of 2009. So he's been gone for five years. But, but he worked with us closely on producing this in 2002. This is all about meeting the $700 billion infrastructure deficit in Australia. And the centrepiece of this was this uh, map of Australia listing 18 major, absolutely major water projects that could be built in this country to drought proof Australia and turn us into a massive food bowl for the whole world and that where the potential is huge. And um, a lot of these ideas are directly the work of Lance Endersby, but they're also, some of them are revived from the post war reconstruction program that um, Ben Chifley intended for Australia but was never achieved and we, we took some of them from them. Lance, Lance's other projects included a, a lot of visionary ideas for high-speed rail in Australia, such as a Melbourne to Darwin fast freight inland express, or Asian express he called it, and then later on a ring rail 
you will see on a map right, right around the outside of Australia that could link the major cities and really turn rail into the basis of our transportation, high technology, high speed rail that could displace a lot of the reliance on road transport that we use today. And, but when we came up with this, we weren't being far-fetched because, you know, straight away you say, well, how are you going to fund it? The project, we, at the time we estimated those water projects alone would cost $40 billion. And that was very big money in 2002. It doesn't seem as big now post the global financial crisis when we're now used to talking trillions. Um, but it's still a lot of money. It'd be more than $40 billion today. But at the whole time, we knew that we could fund it easily because it was premised upon Australia having a national bank. And when you have a national bank that is owned and operated by the government and is, functions as the central bank of the economy, but under government control, not independent, you have a power to create money in the form of credit that you can direct into anything that you'd like. And the only limitation on that power is the, is the, um, uh, the sort of the rule that where you direct it must be productive. If you direct that into a productive industry, the new credit created will not be um, inflationary at all, and that's how you can build the wealth of your economy. Now, for a long time, in Australia we've had a distorted debate, but it's also around the world where if anyone ever raised this, they get laughed down. As, and one expression that gets used is, oh, that's funny money. And probably the, the last time this happened prominently in Australia was in 1998, when someone actually from Paul N. Hansen's One Nation talked about, oh, we need, a, we need to create credit. And the then treasurer, Peter Costello, ridiculed that as funny money. And he said that if that happened, that people would be walking around with wheelbarrows of cash to buy a loaf of bread, you know, um, invoking the memory of what happened in 1923 in Germany. Well, that was in 1998. In 2008, the global financial system melted down. And in the face of that chaos, the world's central banks did something actually openly that if you believe Costello and everyone else who's ever ridiculed this idea it was impossible. They began creating money and we, we turned it pejoratively they've been printing money that was met metaphorically they weren't they didn't actually have to print it because we're in electronic age but they were creating it just as sure as, as surely as if they'd printed it and it was called quantitative easing. So I have with me today an admission by the Bank of England, you can go on their website, and in fact, today's, today's um, uh, topic is dealt with in a press release on the CEC's website called the National Bank Infrastructure Solution, and there's a link in that release to the Bank of England website, but I printed off their pamphlet, Quantitative Easing Explained, and in this pamphlet, the Bank of England, the world's oldest and premier central bank, just straight out admitted what they're doing with quantitative easing supplying more money, how it happens, the bank creates money and uses it to buy assets such as government bonds and high quality debt from private companies. And then later in other places they say, they explain it more, they create it electronically. In that case, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan, they're actually not putting that money into anything productive. They're creating it to lend to, to, not to lend to, they, they, to give to the banks, the too big to fail banks that are all sick from their derivatives gambling and they're holding on all these worthless assets in the form of paper that's actually toxic and the only one willing to buy them are, are these central banks and they give them this new money in exchange for that. And the Fed, in, since 2008, the Federal Reserve alone has printed $4 trillion doing this. $4 trillion. So, what we're advocating in Australia is nowhere near that, but it shows it can be done. And our argument is, yes, that's always been the power of central banks. It should be only operate under government authority and it should be only put into um, uh, projects such as infrastructure, which increase the productivity and wealth of an economy on behalf of its people. And in Australia, we have a precedent for that. And that was the Commonwealth Bank of Australia before it was privatized in 1996 but more accurately before it was um, hamstrung back in 1945. And I'm just gonna go through the history of the Commonwealth Bank now so you, can, you, can, um, you know how it works. First of all, the Commonwealth Bank, again, having this power, um, 
you know, it existed in a country that was very much under the control of the City of London and, war and um, because of our Australia's just colonial relationship with Great Britain. So in most circumstances, it couldn't function properly. But there were two exceptions, and they were the two world wars. World War I, World War II. And under the emergency conditions of war, when the British had bigger fish to fry in Europe and had their own problems, they couldn't concentrate on what was happening in Australia. Patriotic Australians utilised the power of the bank to make sure that Australia did what was necessary for the war effort. In World War I, the bank, not so much as creating credit, but the, what the bank did was harnessed the credit that existed in Australia in the form of savings that the general public had by raising loans for the Commonwealth. And the, bank, the bank led that process. It raised 250 million pounds in loans from Australians and it, didn't, it, it, it only charged a fee that covered its costs. So that was automatically 10 million pounds cheaper than, the, than would have been charged by um, uh, London banks if, if they had been able to still do it. They, uh, I'll just read you through some of the things that they did. The, the Commonwealth Bank doing this, it financed the emergency purchase of ships for the Commonwealth shipping line to maintain trade during the war. It financed payments to farmers so they could maintain production for the war effort. It financed the construction of housing for re returned soldiers and offered home loans to soldiers at 5% for their purchase. More significantly, it also went on an infrastructure um, funding spree let by lending money to local councils. And some, a lot of people in Australia live in areas where the base infrastructure they're still using today was funded by the Commonwealth Bank in World War I. Between 1911 and 1923, the Commonwealth Bank advanced credit of almost 10 million pounds to 60, 60 local councils to develop infrastructure. This included street lighting and power in the St George County Council in Sutherland Shire in New South Wales, a hydroelectric scheme on the Nimboida River for light and power to Grafton, road construction in the Meriden Shire and WA for soldiers, settlers, farmers to transport their wheat, um, a massive expansion in electricity generation for Newcastle because the BHP steelworks had just started there and they need more electricity and their population grew, sewage systems for Ballarat, Bendigo and Geelong, Melbourne's upgrade to electric trams, an electric plant for Perth, among many other things. That's the kind of thing the Commonwealth Bank was able to do in World War I. And that's actually without actually creating credit, it was just harnessing the credit that existed. We're going to take a break now and come back and talk about what happened in World War II, which was far more spectacular. Welcome back to this special edition of the CEC report on the National Bank Infrastructure Solution. So before the, bank, before the break, we we're talking about the Commonwealth Bank and what it was able to do in World War I. In World War II, it set a standard for what should always be done in Australia. Now, between the wars, after the Commonwealth Bank had performed so well in World War I, the private banks were able to gang together and strip it of the powers that it used and therefore it was pretty much useless between the wars, and especially in the Great Depression when there was a big fight because the Labor people said, we need the Commonwealth Bank to do the kind of thing now it did in the war, and the Conservatives and the private bankers wouldn't let it happen. But in World War II, of course, the, the Menzies-led um, Conservatives proved to be absolutely pathetic in defending Australia. They left Australia defenceless. And so Labor came to power, and the two leaders of Labor... John Curtin and Ben Chifley were the fiercest advocates of national banking in our history. And so they knew the power the Commonwealth Bank had. And what they did is they um, did, got the Commonwealth Bank to do the equivalent of what I went through in the previous segment on quantitative easing. They got the Commonwealth Bank to actually create money. They turned on a tap. They used, they used a mechanism called treasury bills. And the, way, the simple way to explain it is think of them as like an IOU from the government where the bank's there, the government borrows from the bank and of course is, intends to pay it back. But the bank holds an IOU from the government and that IOU is as good as money. They can, they, they can use that as, as, they can lend that IOU out into the community and people will take it because of course if the government's going to pay the bank or the government's going to pay them, they think well it's the government, the government's not going to go broke. And so they were able, you can double your, your, you can increase your money supply that way. And they used that a lot. In the nine years before 1942, the Commonwealth Bank only issued a net five million pounds in such, in such treasury bills. But 
When Labor took over under Curtin and Chifley, they turned on the tap because there was a war on. Japan had already landed in Papua New Guinea. They were bombing Australia. They were preparing to invade Australia and they knew we've got no choice. We need a mobilisation here. Our economy was in a terrible shape state it was like a agrarian backwater we need to be able to produce munitions we need to be able to su supply an army and we needed a mobilization it needed to be funded and they got the commonwealth bank to create the money to do it so we'll put a, a table up on the screen where you can see the dramatic increase so from from only using about five million pounds worth of t, t bills in nine, in nine years before 1942 in 1942 the commonwealth bank issued 59 million pounds and that was the basis of a boost in government expenditure to 413 million. In 43, it issued 173 million new pounds, and the government expenditure ballooned to 661 million pounds. In 1944, the Commonwealth Bank issued 77 million pounds in new credit, and the government expenditure was 677 million pounds. And in 1945, the Commonwealth Bank issued 68 million pounds, and government expenditure was 599 million pounds. And then, of course, in 1945, the war ended. Um, when that happened, Commonwealth Bank credit dropped back to next to nothing. Ben Chifley, though, had a plan because he wanted to use Commonwealth Bank credit as much for po peaceful reconstruction post-war as it had been used in the war. And his plan was to finance projects, a big post-war reconstruction program, starting with the Snow Mountain Scheme with the Commonwealth Bank. And when they passed the legislation for, to start the Snowy Mountain Scheme, it's in the legislation that this was to be funded through the Commonwealth Bank. But unfortunately, the combination of the Liberal Party, which had been started in 1944 under, under Menzies by the bankers, and the private bankers themselves ganged up. They took the government to court and ended up in the Privy Council in London. And on behalf of the Crown establishment over there, the Privy Council ruled against the government and was squashed. Um, Chifley was shattered. He lost government in 1949. He died soon afterwards. And even though the Snowy Mountains project went ahead, it was the only one, and it didn't go ahead with any Commonwealth Bank credit. It was entirely funded by the taxpayer, and in fact, Menzies made the Commonwealth, the Snowy Mountains scheme, pay interest on the money that it was um, given by the taxpayer. So you actually tried to put a burden on it, whereas it could have been funded through public credit. Um, before he died in 2004, Jim Cairns had a association with the CEC on this subject and Jim Cairns was the Labor Treasurer under Gough Whitlam and I asked him when Gough Whitlam came to power in 72 and he wanted to build you know, the gas pipeline and buy back the farm why didn't he use this power of national banking that they knew they had that was available to them and Cairns knew it he wrote a book about it called Oil and Troubled Waters where he said you know this is this is what could be done the figures I've just given you came out of his book actually on, on what happened in World War II he wanted to do it in the 1970s but he said, because of what was done to Chifley in 1949, no one in Labor had the stomach to take up that fight again. And so it, for that reason, it wasn't used again. And of course, the Whitlam government Labor was the last of old Labor in Australia. They got sacked by the Queen for their efforts. And when, by the time Labor came back under Hawke and Keating, it was a completely different orientation, totally sold out to the City of London. And so... What I've just gone through, the only reason it's not being used is for political reasons. Not because it can't be done, it can be done. It can be done quite easily. And it's political cowardice that has stopped it up until now because Labor could have, has been in strong position since and could have done it. We have to do it. That's why the CEC is fighting for this. But we've run out of time for this show. There's more on our website about it. Tune in and tune in for more of the CEC report. Mm -hmm.